arms that have emotion and, and uh, you know, really a soul to them. Yesterday we were over here, and when I walked up to this car, we were setting them all up. I got goosebumps on the car. So I think that's a kind of cool thing. And I've been looking at the car for I don't know how many years now, and so it's, it's just still giving me goosebumps. I think it says a lot about these cars because there's just there's something about them. There's like energy that comes off of these. But I wanted to start off with talking a little bit about um, you know these cars. Really, the, the Challenger is an icon, and the Hellcat's an icon, and now the Demon is certainly the next level of an icon. And one of the things that makes an icon is is the, the logo that goes with it. Um, everyone's familiar with the Hellcat logo that they had out, and uh, you know there, there's such a following behind it. You see people that have that logo on the side of their car, and they, they can't get big enough for them. Or even the V6 Challengers running around with the Hellcat logo on it too. But uh, you know, I, in fact, I've seen people with tattoos, with Hellcat tattoos, which just blows me away. That, that go that far, but that's the, that's the level of passion that they have for it. So we knew that when we started off with to develop the demon, the, I mean, there are all kinds of kinds of things pulling from some other Mopar past and things that maybe you know a little too cartoony. Uh, but we looked at everything, and and what we we, we really stood back and said, the Hellcat logo, the cat, is such an icon. How can we take the essence of that and evolve it? And as it evolves, what would it do? How would it look with trying to give this sinister quality to it, but still being from the same family? And you can start to see, you know, a little bit of how it evolved. You know, the chin, we played with the chin, we played with the ears, um, the horns, how far do the horns come forward? Um, is the chin coming forward? Is the chin going rearward? You know, what, what um, conveys that level of energy and, and sinister quality that we wanted to have in it. And this is how we end up, ended up here. And when you see the two logos together, you can really see the, the evolution of it. So uh, we like to take advantage of designing everything that we can from a, from a designer standpoint. Anything that I can touch, I want to I wanna, uh, make it look uh, a certain way and, and put a stamp on it that makes it fit with the rest of the vehicle. So it would be cool to see who gets this tattoo. But um, the car, obviously, as I as I mentioned earlier about the, having it to have a certain level of function to it, this car probably more than any car I've ever worked on. Uh, there was a lot of criteria given from from Chris Collin to he's going to take you through the engine and the amount of breathing that it, that it needed to do, the aero requirements, um, and that's that's what makes this car special though, is because the team all came together on it. Every as Tim mentioned this morning, it's like you know. I've been a hot rodder since I was a kid, so that I can't chance to work on a car like this. And the same that goes for every person that worked on it. And there's a really good chemistry throughout the whole team that I think made that up. So I looked at the, the requirements that my colleagues needed as a challenge because I wanted to make sure I could give them what they needed to make the car perform while still making it look um, as uh, aggressive and, and unique as possible. So we, we talked earlier about the, the wheel flares. Uh, we do laser cut the, uh, the sheet metal on them as well. It's not necessarily just for you know, getting a wider piece, uh, a wider tire on it. That part of it is also to give it a, the correct amount of clearance on it. So the, the fenders are actually laser, laser trimmed before the flare goes on there as well. Uh, on the, the, I guess one of the, the, the biggest pieces that you know, probably recognize it is the hood. And, you know, I mentioned earlier about a car having its presence to it. But this, a lot of this opening was really driven by trying to, to give uh, Chris as much of an air intake and cooling uh, airflow as, as possible on it. And being a little hot rodder on that, you look at cars from the 60s, and you know, there was a lot of different hood scoops done over the years. And, some of them were pretty crude, but they, you know, they always had a presence to them. They always, they always um, it helped create the signature of the car. So we wanted to have that signature with it, make it functional, but just make it massive. And, and truthfully, I mean, I, I wanted this hood to really be a big middle finger to everyone, uh, at least some of our competition on there, because it's so intimidating um, that uh, I wanted everything to have that same level of, uh, of, of flavor to it. You know, with, we didn't know what the horsepower was going to be on the car early on, but we knew it was going to be something heroic. So to me, the fluid and the 
wheel flares is an attitude of the face with a splitter that we've done that integrates into the flares wanted to be every bit as outrageous and, and heroic as all of this, all of those pieces that make up this car. Uh, uh, on, the, on the wheels, uh, you can see here we've designed the front runner, and as a designer, it's like, oh, what have we done to the, to the wheel, the body? You know, we like to, to get the wheels out there as, as much as possible, but it's all about the functional piece of this uh, design. This wheel I mentioned earlier, uh, what we call the double rim on the wide body, this wheel we, we call the whole shot. So we like to have fun with those design, design names as well as the, the shapes on them also. A little story that I wanted, to, I wanted to mention on the hood design now is, when we design a hood or on any car, we have a, a sight line that when you sit behind the driver's, uh, when the driver sits behind the steering wheel, we have some, some uh, criteria that we like to put in so you can see, make sure you're seeing the edge of the hood or not blocking too much of it. So obviously, as you come up, you're gonna make it a little bit harder to see out of the edge of your car. And we wanted to make sure, because we knew this was going to be this, this tall, that um, we weren't going to do something that wasn't necessarily commercial for our customers. So I was driving a Hellcat Challenger at the time, and I had a, a foam piece milled out that would lay into the, the current Hellcat hood. And I uh, actually drove the car around for a while just to make sure um, that, it, that it all worked. So it was kind of a neat little thing, kind of hidden in plain sight, but we wanted to make sure that we weren't going too far with it and that it, that it still functioned. Um, the, the, moving to the back of the car, um, Eric will touch on that a little bit. We actually have a, a, a short piece, the, the shorter spoiler on it to help with uh, reduce the, the drag on it. Uh, on the interior, this one here has the harness bar on it and it, it shows the, the rear seat and front seat deleted. Uh, Alcantara steering wheel on it and uh, the guys are going to get into you know, all the, the functional pieces that you can interface with uh, through the, uh, uh, the, the controls on the IP. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chris Cowan. He's going to take it to the engine. Okay, thanks, Mark. Um, my name is Chris Cowland. I'm responsible for advanced and powertrain, SRT powertrain development um, at FCA. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the engine today. I'm actually going to leave the driveline and transmission portion to Jim. Um, but let's, let's basically go through the engine. Obviously, the big target of this car was to make it as fast as we possibly could down a, a quarter mile strip. So, lots of power and lots of torque. But it's not a tuna car. There are a lot of different constraints that we have as a full-blown engine manufacturer, car manufacturer, that are very, very different to the tuna industry. We've got to meet emissions regulations, obviously. It's a full, road legal, emission compliant vehicle. We've got to meet all of the ODD requirements that carport puts on us. So there's a lot of um, effort that we have to prove the engine is running correctly all of the time. We've got pass-by noise requirements that we, we have to pass. We can't just make the noisiest, loudest car in the world, even if we'd like to. And um, on top of that, the car has to have a full warranty. So the powertrain basically has to survive through all of our traditional validation and durability testing. So if we start to think about how do we how do we generate lots of power and lots of torque through an engine? Um, the first thing is we've got to increase airflow. We need to put a lot of air through the engine on a gasoline engine in order to be able to burn more fuel. So a bunch of enablers on this engine versus the standard Hellcat engine. Very large supercharger, 2700cc supercharger, the largest on any production car at the moment, up from 2.38 litres. Um, we run one bar boost pressure, which is about 25% more than the standard Hellcat works. Uh, 6300 RPM rated speed, standard Hellcat runs at 6000, so run the engine fast and effectively you're pushing more engine, more air through the engine, it's just a big air pump. Mark spoke about the functional hood scoop and the air induction system. Um, the induction system we've got on the car drops the uh, restriction between the air inlet and the engine by about 35%, giving us even more airflow into the engine. And then 
we've got this chiller system that basically we use the AC system to do double duty and reduce the temperature in our low temp cooling circuit and that reduces the air temperature going into the engine by about 10 Celsius, 10 centigrade. And then to make sure after you've run down the drag strip that we can take away all the heat cycle effects when you shut the car off, we actually have this after run pump and after run cooler where we run both the fan in the vehicle and also an electric pump to continue to pump coolant around the low temperature cooling circuit, lowering the temperature in the intercoolers from the heat soak effect so that the next time we go down the drag strip, the car's ready to go and hasn't suffered from those heat soak effects. And just to give you a couple of crazy numbers, um, the amount of airflow that we put through a demon engine, uh, if we were to hook the inlet up to the cabin in the car, 800 feet down the drag strip, there'd be no air left in the vehicle. Um, so, and at the end of the uh, drag strip, we've consumed about 5,000 litres of air, uh, which is equivalent to about 800 human flow capacity. So, a massive amount of air going in this engine in order to produce the power we do. So we've got air in the engine, we've got to put fuel in there to match. So significantly upgraded injectors from the Hellcat, 67 grams a second will flow through those injectors. And we've got a very special twin fuel delivery pumps where in order to push that amount of fuel through those injectors, we've got two pumps that run and we run variable pressure. So we run 250 kPa, at low load and then up to 700 kPa. And that's one of the emission enablers that we have. Um, we have to be able to put very small, very finely metered quantities of fuel in when we're running on the emission cycles. And we've got these huge injectors. The only way that we can get them to react the way that we need them to is to have relatively low fuel pressure under those conditions. So the twin pump system is specifically designed to get very, very high flow at rated power, but also low flow in a controllable manner to meet the emissions regulations. And then of course we've got the high octane calibration. We really want to use this 100 octane fuel um, to get the very best out of the engine. It gives us an improvement in knock resistance of the engine and allows us to put about 5 to 8 degrees more spark advance. Um, and that results in about a 15 to 30 bar increase in firing pressure within each cylinder. And I'll talk a little bit about that in the future. This 500 pounds an hour of fuel goes into the engine when it's running on a dyno at full power. 500 pounds of high octane gasoline. Give you a rough idea, that's about 1.36 gallons a minute. If you stood under the shower in the hotel this morning, that shower was probably delivering about two gallons a minute. So it'll give you some perception of how much fuel has to go into that engine to propel that car down a drag strip. It's a huge amount of fuel. Next thing we have to do is manage all the heat that we produce in the engine. Obviously, we got a lot of heat that gets converted into crank shaft energy but we also have heat going into the cooling system and out of the exhaust. So very, very highly upgraded cooling pack with, we've got this low temperature loop, a high temperature loop and then the AC chiller and again just to give you a rough idea, 250 kilowatts of heat rejection when the engine's running at full power. That's the equivalent of 250 electric toasters. If you guys imagine sitting, if I put 250 electric toasters in front of you, you get pretty warm. That's how much heat that engine puts into the cooling system when it's running at full power. And we have to be able to manage that, um, otherwise we'd have to derate the engine. So all of that creates massive thermomechanical loading in the engine. It's all very well producing this power, but it's reacted through the structure. 
Every time we fire um, at rated power on high octane fuel, it's about 135 bar firing pressure in each cylinder. And so all of the critical fasteners that ultimately hold the whole structure together need to be upgraded. And all of the rotating and reciprocating components are also upgraded to be able to handle that heat and that load that we generate. The pistons obviously see a huge amount of that heat, so we've got 2,500 degrees um, Celsius in each combustion chamber, peak temperature. Piston alloys won't live at 2,500 degrees. Um, so we squirt oil on the bottom of the pistons to keep them cool. The Demon runs twice as much piston cooling as the standard Hellcat runs. Um, it's the only way that we can keep the pistons to a low enough temperature so they will survive our durability tests. The 6500 RPM fuel cut, I said peak power is at 6300, but fuel cut comes at 6500 to allow for a gear shift timing. Um, obviously from a dynamics perspective, we have to make uh, all of the valve chain components, all of the components work. So new valve springs, uh, new cam profiles, and then we also, the valve springs get extremely hot at that speed, so we have had to increase the cooling, the oil cooling to the valve springs. There's about a, a third more oil that we spray on the valve springs just to keep those cool so we can uh, make them there. I'll give you a little bit of another crazy set of numbers. Every time we fire the cylinder, there is 11 tons of load on top of each piston. 11 times. Every time we hit top dead centre on the exhaust stroke, there's three tons trying to yank the piston off the end of the con rod. So, 14 ton, if you like, load reversal every single time the engine rotates, and that's 50 times a second at 6300 RPM. So, absolutely massive loads. And to give you another comparison, if you think that the piston weighs about 700 grams and it's doing about 2600 G and the salt rifle, the bullet weighs about 25 grams and it only does 2000 G when it leaves the barrel. So that gives you a sort of idea about how difficult it is to stop the piston every time, bring it back down to the bottom and then send it back up again. Way, way more energy than there is in the salt rifle. From a development perspective, the only test cells we could run this thing were our original NASCAR dynos. We didn't have any other dynos in the, uh, in the shop that could physically hold the engine, so there are a couple of dynos we ran dedicated to demon development, um, 1200 horsepower dynos. As I said before, absolutely standard validation procedures, so there are no lets on this engine from a durability perspective it has to pass all the conventional tests that you drove the Durango. The Durango engine passes the same tests as the, as the Demon engine. And to give you an idea from a vehicle development perspective, we had one vehicle um, which did over 1100 drag strip passes including more than 500 on the stand on the original drive one. So Jim spent most of his summers driving and accumulating those hours. Quick run the video. Um, in order to rate
official SAE rating run. We actually had the Society of Automotive Engineers come in and rate all of our engines, every production engine that we, uh, we produce. They basically look um, and ensure that we're running the engine under exactly the same conditions that you would see in the vehicle. And although that video was speeded up, um, the whole procedure takes about five minutes. So we have to stabilize the engine for a certain period of time and then take average readings for another certain period of time. And then SAE actually certify the power and torque for the particular engine. Um, I think you've all heard the numbers before on um, 91 fuel, 808 horsepower, 6300 RPM, 717 pounds feet of torque, and then when we change to high octane fuel, 840 horsepower, and 770 pounds feet of torque. And the 770 pounds feet of torque, to me, is even more remarkable than the 840. It's one of the things that make the car so quick down the drag strip. With all of the driveline uh, modifications and launch devices that Jim's going to talk about, it enables us to launch the car with a massive amount of torque. Um, so, really, really pretty impressive set of numbers. We're obviously happy from an engine perspective, and I'll hand things over to Jim to um, talk about the vehicle. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jim Wilder, uh, vehicle, development and, yeah, vehicle Development Manager and SRT for the Challenger Charger Program. Uh, I've been at SRT since about 99, uh, so I work on the SRT 4 Neon. And really, since working on that program, I've been dreaming and dreaming about doing a car like this, trying to figure out the right platform to do that. And in doing the Hellcat program, we really realized, many of us really realized that we now had something, a great place to start from, uh, to build the car that we see today. Uh, what I want to do is I want to kind of take a step back and go through the real basics of how you take a Hellcat and make it a demon. And it really goes back about 300 years to Sir Isaac Newton and his second law of motion, which is F equals MA. Uh, force equals mass times acceleration. When we're talking about a drag car, the, the key item in there is the acceleration part. So when we move that formula around and separate the A, it's A equals force divided by mass. So we really need to focus on increasing force and reducing mass as much as possible to increase the A. So that's, kind of, that's really the basics of how this car happens. So let's talk about mass, first, uh, first part of that equation. So many of you have probably heard some of this talk before. Uh, we took roughly 200 pounds out of the car. Um, before the program was really approved, we spent hours and hours going over the bill of material of the car. Um, really and truly, every nut and bolt was looked at. Do we really need that part? Can we modify that part and not lose uh, the effectiveness of that that we need or the function that we need? Um, we thrifted things, we reduced weight on other things. We ended up with about a 5% uh, weight reduction in the car uh, with the weight savings. And if we go back to our formula, and these numbers don't mean anything other than they're easy for simple math. I just picked F equals four and M equals two. Makes for pretty easy math. So if we start with a Hellcat as four over two, we have an acceleration of two. If I reduce my mass by 5%, that 2 becomes 1.9, and I now end up with an acceleration of 2.1, or 5% improvement. Pretty straightforward, pretty simple stuff. Makes logical sense. If I can make the car lighter, I can make the car faster. Now, let's talk about the force part, because the force part is what we obviously had to spend a tremendous amount of time on. And really, when we talk about force, it's the torque that comes through the drive line, plus the grip that we get at the tire to shove the car off the starting line. It's not one, it's not the other, it's both together. One without the other does us no good. We need them both. Um, so Chris already went into a lot of detail about the engine. Uh, the target was a 10% increase, but we also had very lofty goals for performance. Um, I, I'm not sure that all of us would have been 100% satisfied with just 10%. Um, engineers usually on these kind of programs, we always push and push and push. 
And there was a subgroup of us, I would say, that called the Edison Bob, not Bennett. Uh, and you can see the reason why Bob um, has a particularly nice ring to it. Like Chris said, though, the torque that we made on high octane fuel is really something that's pretty special. I mean, these levels of torque are like diesel truck levels of torque, and yet we still make over 800 horsepower. Getting that much torque out of the flywheel to set down the drive line is tremendous. It's, it's a huge enabler for getting the car off the line quickly. Um, and we also added something else called Torque Reserve, another enabler to help the car get off the line. And what this does is it modifies fuel and spark timing at the starting line in drag mode and launch control to be able to build boost at the starting line where you can't do with the normal foot brake type launch. Um, we can actually build up to 8.3 pounds of boost at the starting line with torque reserving gauge. So we've made a lot more torque. We've got a lot more torque at the flywheel, so now we're going to move downstream to the transmission. Now the transmission is this, in, 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 this, in the sense of the transmission itself, it's a stock Calcant transmission. We upgraded the, convert, the torque converter in it from a 137K to a 151K, and really the K factor is, is a coefficient that describes the stall speed and the torque multiplication. So what that means in layman's terms is we got 18% additional torque multiplication with this change, and we also increased stall speed by about four or 500 RPM. So I increased torque multiplication, and I now put the car in a fatter part of the torque band, so again, more torque. Um, and then obviously we've talked about this, the trans brake. That was, it's a pretty staple, a normal staple thing for an automatic drag car, but a first for an OEM. Nobody's ever done this. And with the trans brake, we engage an additional clutch while in first gear, and that binds or locks the transmission up so that we're actually holding the car at the starting line with the transmission, not the brakes. It's, it's the first few times I used it, it was pretty unnerving being at the starting line, taking my foot off the brake pedal and the car not moving. Um, it's something that you guys will, some of you will hopefully have the chance to experience tomorrow. Um, and it's, it's a very unique, uh, unique feeling if you haven't done it before. Um, go back, sorry. If you can. So, what these, what these changes did to the car from the driver perspective, and I remember coming back after testing and telling people, even if we got zero performance improvement with the torque converter change, we didn't get to do it. Just the way it made the car feel. It really turned it from a fast car with drag radials to the feeling of a drag car. It was really an impressive change. And then on top of that, it picked up a tenth of a second for the torque converter change alone, and then we got another tenth of a second for the transfer. Those numbers don't sound like good numbers, but when you're talking about a car that's going low tens already, very close to nine, those changes in Delta and ET are huge. Those are big numbers. People pay lots of money on the race cars to get that kind of performance improvement. So moving downstream from there, so we've built more torque in the flywheel. We've now multiplied it with a new torque converter. We're building more torque at the starting line, the trans brake and the torque reserve. Now we're going down the drive line. Still not satisfied with the performance we had, we looked at the rear axle. We changed the rear axle ratio from a stock 262 on a Hellcat to a 309. That is the same number as what's in a 6.4 automatic, but it is not the same differential. Uh, and just a little side note there, 309 may not seem like a big number, but when you've got a 471 first gear in the transmission, comparing that to an old school 727 three speed, which is a 245 first gear, it's the equivalent of putting a 594 rear end ratio in a three-speed automatic, which obviously is a huge number. So we have lots of multiplication at the starting line. And we also obviously have an eight-speed, so we've got the uh, advantage of having overdrive. Uh, the axle ratio by itself is worth another tenth to a tenth and a half a second. That's another 18% increase in torque multiplication. And in order to handle that, we had to upgrade parts downstream. Um, so the prop shaft has been increased to material thickness and material property strength. The rear differential, again, it's the same number as the 6 4 automatic, it's a completely different rear end. Uh, material strength in the case was improved and heat, treat heat treatment was revised. And the ring and pinion uh, material was also improved, uh, significant improvements in strength. And what, as well as the half shafts, we couldn't leave those unchanged, those were all upgraded as well, every piece of that. Uh, and you can see in the picture on the side, 
Uh, this was actually something the supplier wanted to do to help differentiate this axle housing. It actually has the theme embossed on the bottom of it, so that's going to be something special, I think, in years to come, too. So now we've got all this additional torque. We've got from the engine, the converter, the axle, the trans brake, the torque reserve. Now we've got to make the other part of it work. We've got to make the grip part of it work. We've got all this torque out of the wheel line. Now we've actually got to put all that additional torque to the ground and propel the car forward. And we did that two ways. One is we modified the suspension. It's a significant retune to the suspension with much softer springs, much smaller, lighter, hollow sway bars. And then we significantly retune the shocks. We still have ABS, and we still have three modes, but we went from street sport and track to street sport and drag. And the focus in drag is taking weight from the front of the car from the front axle to the back of the car, transferring weight as quickly as we can to help put the normal load on the back and the tire. We also remachined the rear axle, or the rear knuckle, sorry, uh, and took about a half of the degree of camera out of the rear axle, the rear the rear tire so that the tire is now standing up straighter to plant more um, on the contact, nor the contact patch on the surface. These changes alone were worth an 11% improvement in grip. Nothing else, that was worth 11%. So that's a significant change by retuning the car. Um, but you can't do a drag car without the proper tire. So we got with our partners at Nitto. We started with an off-the-shelf tire they had, a 315 40R18, uh, the NTO5, and we worked with them and retuned that tire. We actually did about two and a half on all the submissions. We actually did partial submission before the program was even approved officially, before they were sore, I should say, so. uh, We started doing that to start fine-tuning for what the first submission would actually be. And what, we, what the result was is we revised the compound and construction of the tire, We've rebranded the tire, we changed the, the speed rating on the tire from 149 to 168, and we ended up with a tire that's got more grip and is more consistent than the off-the-shelf tire. If the tire does not have a, the Demon branding on it, it is not the Demon tuned tire. Um, that is exclusive to the car. Uh, and that made a significant difference uh, in the performance of the car. So all those things together, along with the drive line things that we talked about, the engine things we talked about, are, getting, are, are to get this car to get the force uh, increased as much as we could possibly could. So if we summarize all the force things up, the engine, the torque converter, the trans brake, the rear axle changes, the suspension changes, the tire changes, the, the creation of the new tire, we end up with a 25% increase in path, increase in the force. So if we look at, going back to a formula, we already reduced mass by 5% from 2 to 1.9. Now we've taken our force and we're increasing it from five, from 4 to 5, a 25% increase. We combine those two things together, we get an A of 2.6. So that 30% change, what does that mean? That means we take a Hellcat that goes high 10s to a demon that runs 965 and a quarter mile. A humongous, humongous change in performance. And something that uh, is out of, kind of out of the world of what we thought was even possible when we started the program, but it's something that through uh, drive and the team that we had, we were able to accomplish by pulling, out, pulling all the things together. So a little bit of drag racing 101 here. Uh, Unfortunately, we're not going to be able to drive today, so a little, a little bit of this you'll have to remember for tomorrow. Um, I'm not sure how many people have been to a drag strip before or actually run on a drag strip. So we want to take some little baby steps here. Um, before we run the cars, we've got about four or five engineers, maybe six tomorrow, depending on how many we get back here, um, that will left seat with everybody least once before you're allowed to drive the car on the track. If you want more passes, that's fine. Uh, if you're comfortable after one, that's fine as well. Um, but everybody's going to get that demo before they run the car. We're going to do a couple of things. We're going to show you kind of where the burnout box is, how to do a burnout, get into the race, the, the radio pages to show you how to engage line one, uh, do a proper burnout, pull to the starting line, show you where the beams are, the staging beams are. There's two light beams that go across the track. One is the pre-stage beam, and at the top of the Christmas tree, you can see the top set of light bulbs come on. Once you pull forward, you, you fully stage, the second set of beams will come on. 
And at that point, the Christmas tree is kind of engaged, you're ready to go. Um, your, your demonstrator, your, your driver will show you all these different steps. They will also show you different methods to launch the car, which I'll go through in a minute as well. Um, while we're on the track, windows up. Uh, if you want to roll the window down on the return road, that's cool. Uh, I would encourage that. It'll probably be warm. And we're not running any scan the drag strip because we're going to drop water on the track if we do that. Uh, you also should be in drag mode when you're on the drag strip, which will be running the chiller system, which Chris talked a little bit about, which does run the AC. Uh, but we've accommodated that. The chiller will condense water on it, and we've got a collection. We've got a little, uh, basically in the bottom of the duct underneath, and we've got a, a pad that will absorb that water so we don't drip on the track. I actually thought about that because it was a concern. Um, going down track, if you lose grip, lift. If you get out of the groove, don't fight it, lift. Bring the car back safely. We don't need to go into the wall. That would be really sad and bad. And if you're not hurt, we're going to get really mad at you. And we're still going to get mad at you if you're hurt. A little less mad at you. Um, two people in the car. So during the demo runs, we will run to the eighth mile. If you want to do more runs with somebody with you in the car, eighth mile. When you have one person in the car, we're fine running to the quarter mile. Both of those, if you're not familiar, they're marked on the side wall, on the left side of the track. There's cones pointing out where the 8 mile marker is, where the 4 mile marker is. There's also blocks in the middle of the track where those markings are as well. Uh, those are for the timing system. Um, our plan was to get everybody three runs at a time, so you can run round robin three times, give yourself a little bit of hope what you're doing before you get out of the car. We'd like everybody to get a shot at running the car before we start taking second turns. So we're going to get some time in. Um, one thing I want to point out, one thing I want to know, because people do, if you're not familiar, get confused by this. When the Christmas tree comes down, so yellow, 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 green, the timers haven't started yet until you move. Until you uh, close the beam, I guess you could say, until your tire rolls forward and the beam across the track closes, the timer hasn't started again. Um, so you can sit at the starting line and get your RPMs adjusted, whatever it is you need to do before you leave, and that's not an issue that doesn't screw up your time at your home. Um, okay, a little bit about launching the demon. There's three ways to do it. One of them's pretty complicated. We'll spend a little bit of time on that one in the end. First one's pretty straightforward. Foot braking or brake torquing the car. I'm sure everybody's done this. We've done this at stoplights, I'm sure. Uh, never on the street, though, of course, I'm sure. Uh, left foot on the brake pedal, right foot on the gas pedal, bring the RPM up to your desired RPM. Uh, depending on the track conditions, generally 15 to 1800 RPM is a pretty good place. Let go of the brake and apply the gas as quickly as the track will allow. This isn't a PlayStation, this isn't a video game. This car's got a tremendous amount of power. If you're at a track that's not very grippy and you just go walk, you're just going to spin tires. Um, so you really have to adjust your pedal rate to what the track and what the car will give you. Launch control, and this is, this is probably the method that I would suggest you spend some time playing it to get a feel for how the car responds and how the car launches and how hard it launches. This is still a very quick way to run the car. Um, launch control, we've had this since 2013. That's adjustable on the radio uh, for 18 mile a year. We, uh, we improved the uh, refinement of that from 250 RPM increments to 100 RPM increments. Uh, so we've got a little more refinement there. I would suggest somewhere between 12 and 1800 RPM. That's adjustable on the radio. Again, your demo rider will show you how to adjust that. Uh, once you have that set in the radio and you activate it, make sure it's activated. Just, you'll get a message in the cluster in front of your face. The switch will also light up on the, on the switch bank. Left foot on the brake firmly. Right foot watt very quickly. You want to get watt within one second, less than one second. What we find people do is they go into the gas a little bit too slowly, or if you go in and you hear the tire chirp at all and you back off, the launch control is not deactivated. So if you go back in watt, now you're just doing a burnout because launch control has been shut off. So put on the brake firmly, commit to it, go in fast on the gas pedal, foot on the floor, the car will hold at the RPM you set. And then release the brake pedal and leave your foot at watt and the electronics will manage the tire system. So again, another pretty easy way to launch the car. Uh, trans brake. 
Uh, so the one we spent a little bit of time talking about, and probably one of the cooler features of the DNN, uh, the fact that we were able to do this in an OEM application. It's only available in drag mode. So select drag mode in the radio, just like you would track mode or sport mode. Select drag mode, transbrake is now available. You will get a message in the cluster when you go into track mode that transbrake is available. You'll then pull back on both panel shifters simultaneously. Um, once you do that, left foot on the brake, right foot on the gas, bring the RPM up between 1500 and 2350. The reason we're doing that is we're taking load out, but we're taking lash out of the drive pump to reduce the impact loads that are created from the launch uh, to reduce the stress in the drive wing. This is a critical step. Uh, once that is achieved, you can let go of one of the paddles, either one, left or right, doesn't matter. Let go of one of the paddles, then let go of the brake pedal. If you do it out of order, trans brake will cancel. Pedal, let go of the pedal, let go of the brake, and now it's going to be very feeling. At that point, you can now adjust the RPM again with the with the uh, with your right foot between 950 and 2350 RPM. Once you do that, the car is being held by the transmission. Let go of that last paddle, which everyone's left, right or left. And then again, kind of as we were talking about with uh, with brake torque in the car, apply the gas pedal as you're releasing the paddle at whatever level the track will take. Some tracks you can go very quickly on the pedal. Other tracks, if it's not a very sticky track, or if it's whatever the conditions might be, um, you might have to slow down your pedal rate. Uh, one tip I will give you is when you're applying the throttle, if you give the car just a slight split second to let the nose rise on the car and start transferring weight, you can go on really quick after that happens. Um, one more slide, I think, and I'll shut up. Um, so rules while we're on here, after all going through the demo rider, control, we're free to drive the vehicles. We'll do that kind of as a group. Once everybody is out of the cars doing the demos, we'll get everybody up, all the, all the SRT drivers out. Um, at that point, we'll have some of them go to the starting line to help guide people through the water box, pull them forward out of the water. You never want to do a workout in the water box. So we'll help guide people forward, help guide people up to the starting line stage and games. Uh, and then we'll run one car at a time at the track. We'll use both planes, so we'll stagger them, but we use one car at a time. Um, we're not racing, uh, we're not handing out time slips. Uh, and then, okay, so I already mentioned watch for people directing you, so we're going to have at least a few people up there helping guide people through this. Uh, if you've done this before, it'll be uh, a little elementary, but just pay attention to what people are showing. And then if you want to take video, if you want to take video, basically pass the starting line, be on the outside of the guardrails. Uh, if you want to take video of the starting line, we need to be in the opposite lane or behind the car. Uh, we don't want anybody standing in front of the car on the lane that the car is running. Uh, that's it. All right. Uh, any questions? Lawrence? Sure. In general, what's the, what's the ideal uh, tire? So we've got them set. Hello? There we go. So we usually set them at about 20 PSI cold. Um, and we want them around 23 to 24 PSI hot. That seems to be a really good place for the tire. So they started as D-Rate, 149. Yeah. We worked with Nitto to increase that as much as we could. We asked about going to Y, which is 186. And they said we would give up longitudinal grip if we went to 186. And we said that's not a compromise that we can take on a car like this. What is it for the Y-Body on that? Uh, top speed in the Y-Body, I want to say is 195 in the automatic and 190, 191 or 193 in the manual. So it's not, not heralded, heralded Sorry? If you're able to drive 195 and one, but only 168. In a wide body, you call it that. You can run 195, and a demon, we're limited to 168. 
it's the tire limitation. The car comes with a tire that is only U rated or whatever rating, you can't allow the car to go. That, that, that's nothing new. Um, you guys remember Buick Grand Nationals, I think, were set at like 107 or something back in the 80s. Is, is there an alternate system to be able to get you to go faster if you're not? So, if you put a wide body tire on the car and the aftermarket controller from the crate, we lift the speed limit on the car. But you need to put a different tire on the car. If you go over 168 with the Ditto, that's um, certainly not a recommendation. 140. All right, so again, uh, the guys are here. If you have any other questions uh, or looking for clarification on anything, we've got a Durango SRT that you can tow with. Uh, we also have a loop if you want to take a Durango SRT or also a, uh, a wide body around here, uh, we can do that. Otherwise, uh, you know, we've got the same cars that are going uh, that are going back to the hotel. I know some of you were uh, leaving early and were, uh, were shuttling you to the airport. Uh, dinner tonight, reception is at 6.30 in the same place, so if you weren't there last night, it's in the lobby. As you would come in from the street, it's to the left. And then, uh, excuse me, reception at 6.30 there, 7 o'clock will get you over to dinner off-site. And uh, thanks, thanks again for the day. All right. Hey guys, thanks for joining us today on this live presentation. We are super excited to have uh, the demon here with us. Uh, the problem, of course, is, well, let me show you the problem. Come on with me. Uh, it's been torrential downpours here at Indy nonstop the whole day. I mean, it's been as hard of a rain as I've ever seen. We're here at the Lucas Oil racetrack, but while we've got the cars lined up, there you go. Cars are all lined up, ready to go. You can see them. There's the, uh, there's the drag strip. It's still raining. The bottom part of that drag strip is basically a lake. We came in here and you really need a boat almost to get down the drag strip. So the plan was that we were going to do the video today and then uh, edit it and give it to you uh, hopefully on the 20th, which is when we have the uh, embargo. But unfortunately, we have to come back tomorrow. Um, Dodge is kind of allowed us to come back tomorrow and actually run the car, but today there's no drag racing. We were actually in Indy this morning where we got to take the wide body around the track. Not because, once again, too much rain. So just been uh, kind of a snake bitten day. But let's, let me kind of walk you around the uh, car so you can see the interior of it. Let me walk you around the engine so you can check that out. And also, I want to thank Ian for supporting this super chat. Thank you, Ian. Uh, we're really grateful for all your support. And I want to thank Dodge for making the best out of a really tough day. So come on, show them the engine. Now, a lot of you may be wondering. Welcome around, Tommy. Come back. Oh, that's right. Yeah, and the guy, yeah, I think I say I'm one turns about twenty-five thousand. Show him the supercharger. So I wonder why. I gotta look. I wonder and why it's more yeah. or what's the advantage over Now, a lot of you may be wondering, is this the same engine that's in the Hellcat? And I talked to the engineer about that. And he said that this engine is 65% different because of the fact that it's running that much more power. It doesn't seem like 707 horsepower versus 840 is different, but when you're running 100 octane race fuel, it does actually change a lot of the different internals of the engine. Uh, the supercharger is bigger. Um, everything has been beefed up to, to be able to handle that. Now, in the car, you can actually set what kind of fuel you're running, whether it's 91 octane or race fuel. When you push 91, you get, um, I think it's like 807 horsepower. And when you push the uh, race fuel, then you get 840 horsepower. If you were running uh, race fuel and you don't tell the car, it still thinks you're running 91, so it won't give you 840. So you actually have to let it know. So let's go and take a look at the inside of the car. Keep in mind there are a couple options. Uh, the seats, those are a $1 option. Let me show you those. Also, I was talking to Tim Kaniskas, the CEO of Dodge earlier today, and you can get a sunroof. It is a $5,000 option. This car starts at about $82,000. So if you want a sunroof, add another $5,000 to it. 
Uh, Tim wanted to actually make it 10,000 because he didn't want a sunroof in these cars. These are race cars, these are drag strip cars, and sunroofs are heavy and people don't want, if you're drag racing at least, you don't want a lot of weight, so they made the sunroof very expensive on purpose. Uh, show them the tires, Tommy, so they can see the difference. these tires from the factory this car is a lot slower than the regular Hellcat or white body Hellcat because once again the tires only rated to 148 so the manufacturer can't make the car any faster than it. Let's go over here and let's look at the other car. I mean, this I, actually I has a drag center. You don't have the drag setup with the smaller front wheels. This has the setup with the drag racing Harness. harness and it and once you go inside it's kind of dark in there but why don't you show me inside and for a dollar more of course you get the added seats. Now that's a marketing ploy, right? I mean, it's just done for marketing purposes. Now, a lot of you may be wondering how many of these are they building and how many are they selling and are they all sold right now? So 3,300 of them are being built. Uh, I asked him whether all 3,300 have been sold and he said they just started taking orders so they're not quite sure. So there may be some available, but they're allocated to the dealers and the dealers actually get the chance to sell them. If the dealers don't sell them, um, Dodge takes back those reservations and gives them to other people, but right now only 3,300 of these will be built. Production of this car starts sometime in October, maybe even a little bit later, so they're not available as of yet. But let me show you some of the stuff you get with them. Uh, actually, you know what? This is uh, these are some of the parts that you get. I, I, I think that's the uh, whatever. That's the uh, so that's. That's the specific uh, um, controller, I think. You know, I don't know what that is, so I'll be making stuff up. So I'm not, I'm not going to make stuff up. But let's go look at the let's go look at the components of the engine. They they have uh, basically a, an engine here that you took apart. So we can go look at the whole thing. I can show you that. This is uh, Eric, he's one of the uh, engineers responsible for the chassis dynamics, right, of the yes. car. And he's actually driven it uh, to its top speed. And beyond. And, be and beyond. <laughs> so, can, Eric, can you walk me through some of these parts, kind of tell me what we got here? And what, what makes what makes the Demon engine different from the uh, Hellcat engine? Well, this, uh, this of course, is the, is the power chiller that utilizes refrigerant from the AC system to actually cool the supercharger cooling circuit fluid, which is not part of the radiator fluid, it's so low temp circuit. And again, the great thing about this is you can actually cool the supercharger fluid um, to 10 degrees C below ambient temperature. And over here we got the valves. We've different? got the valves and the valve springs. Chris talked about how we've got a lot more oil spring on the, on the uh, valve springs as well to make them live. Um, We've got its own specific uh, camshaft that's actually gun -jill, drilled for weight. Uh, forged pistons with, that are coated, again, with uh, tons of force, 14 tons of load reversal that's going on those. This uh, crankshaft is incredible. Look at that. My well, God. yeah, but it needs to be, considering the solar pressures, right? right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The crank definitely needs to be uh, beefed up. Same thing with the rod. It's still a powdered metal rod, though, so you get that good mating surface of the bearing. Of course, I'm a suspension guy talking about engine parts, right? I know, but that's all right. And we've got our larger 2.7 liter blower instead of a, our 2.3 and change liter blower to get the extra airflow out of it. And the other thing is you can take a smaller blower and spin it faster and make more boost, yep. but it's just like taking a small, smaller turbo and turning up the boost. You're going to beat up the air more, you're going to generate more heat. So again, with a bigger blower here, just like a bigger turbo, you're going to make more power at the same boost level. Well, because you're more efficiently compressing the air right, with a higher volume. Let's talk about the torque converter. Believe it or not, I'm an old torque converter durability engineer. All right, so, so this, this you feel comfortable lives. talking about. <laughs> well, this is a lockup clutch mechanism, actually. And um, 
so what we have is the torque converter that uh, the similar torque converter we have you can see we have all braised joints here for strength in the uh, in the uh, turbine blades we've got a unique stator and these the, the uh, shape of these are always specifically designed to turn the air to turn the oil around in the converter because it's really a fan blowing on a fan with a uh, something directing it on there only choosing oil is needed. Finally we have the beefed up drive shaft because of the extra torque that we have. Right, beefed up. Let me see how heavy that is. That's not too bad. It's still hollow but yeah, the wall thickness is 20% thicker and it uses higher yield strength material. Yeah. We've got beefed up half shafts. These look like school bus parts to me don't they? No, these are very heavy. Just look at the bars too and I you know. can see they're also different diameters and that's to help with power hop or tire shape okay, all right. to decouple each side and Interesting. that's a common thing to So do. one's a little bit bigger than the other. Yeah, so they have different torsional stiffnesses so they don't excite each other. Okay. And then of course this is the Demon Differential with the uh, with the 320 rear end or the 320 uh, ratio and with it's specific to the Demon and we've even got it in the case. We've got coolers of course, cooling fins on there to keep we've, it. And we've had those uh, you know, on the Hellcats uh, since they came out and that's for running, tra running track days. That's something that we have on all the Hellcats to help keep the differential temperatures under control. So, so let's put it all together. This is a beautiful model. I mean, look at this thing. It's absolutely gorgeous. First, let's talk about the color, right? I mean, is that Hemi Red? Is that where that came from? That's the that's that's the red we've chosen to give it its own specific. And you know, Demon Evil, right? Yeah, yeah. Red Hell. I love this. Show him this, Tommy. Show him the little guy. There's a little bit of Star Wars uh, nerd chic in there. It is with yeah. uh, you know having, uh, having him come out of carbonite. And uh, you can see we got the the meat, the meat grinder here, the shredder. Yeah, what, you know what I always find amazing is that you can have an engine that produces 840 horsepower, runs, you know, like the engine in any regular car, right? Let's say any normal car that you would just use for a commuter, and then you could take it to your local Dodge dealership and have it serviced to some extent, right? Well, that's the difference I mean, between any, OEs and aftermarket, yeah. right? Do you do any servicing things? I mean, is this, is this something that you can actually service? or you Absolutely. Plug, yeah, you plug in like a code and find out what, what it's doing. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, yeah, it's the same. And, you know, the large can be replaced. It's not like a, the Cummins diesel engine where we buy from Cummins as is right, and yeah. it gets replaced in a warranty. No, this is the engine that we make. So, um, you can actually see that there's two different rotor, rotor sizes. Well, it's hard to see here. There's two different, you can see that the rotors are not spinning the same speed. And that's yeah, yeah. How it's it gets that's it's really cool. cool. Excuse me. Blasting. But actually, the air's not going down, remember. The air's coming in the front here. It's getting blown up, right? And then gets turned around 180 degrees, goes through the intercoolers. Yep. And you can see, if you look down there, straight into the ports. And these intercoolers cover every single port. There are some other designs from other manufacturers where not every port has the full What I found amazing was that you said when it's going down the drag strip you will use up all the air in the car in the first 800 feet if you, if you were to drag the air out yeah of the if you were to evacuate the air and yeah. seal the windows hard enough yeah, yeah. That, that is, that is it's incredible. like driving a, it's like driving a sprint car because the guys in the sprint cars you know there's so little air under the wing yeah, yeah, yeah. they have to hold their breath so, so yeah. let's let's see what's over there So tell me about the Demon Box first of all. Well, the Demon Box are the things that we offer, you know, aftermarket that we couldn't put on from the factory. Right. The customer, each customer, they're not going to be available to just anybody. Each customer who's buying the car will be able to buy one Demon Box, right? And yep. it has some of the things for uh, to get to the 840 horsepower number from 808 and also to prep the vehicle for the track. So we've got the different air filter element. We've got the switch bank, which actually has the high octane fuel switch on it. That's right. So there's a you switch if you, if you put in race fuel. Right. But the vehicle does sense it. If it picks up knock that you don't have 100 octane in it, it will, uh, it but, will pull but, the but, but I heard it goes, it, it, it'll, it'll, if you put lower fuel in it, it knows, but you have to tell it if you put the higher fuel right. in it. Okay. Right. Okay. You have to hit the button and put it right, in high right. octane mode. Gotcha. And then um, we also have the engine controller that allows the high octane mode. And then that also allows the higher speed limit, right? Once you, that's, that's basically the controller that says, I've got non- It's not a production tires. controller. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Right. And so, um, yes, there's the valve vent. You guys have put a lot the of thought into this. Vent. Yes, the HVAC vent, which gives you 
know, the demon, and it's built specifically. That's one numbered. One built and numbered, right? That's for Horace Dodge. And we get, of course, the bag of tools. This is open. No, and it, this is what the air filter comes in. It's like Christmas. Yes, it is like Christmas, and your bag of your bag of stuff to put things in, and also the tools so that you can <laughs> you get demon tools. Look at this. The, so you can put the skinnies on, yeah. <laughs> so that you can put the skinnies on when you go to the strip. And okay. then let's oh, let's see. Going. What else we got? Let's see what else. I think we also have a tire gauge as well. In here, well, that's not in here. There's yeah. also a demon tire gauge. Yeah. That comes with it, so you can set your tire pressures. Because you got to put them back up before you go on the street. And that all comes in that box. All comes in the box. Right. Did you get the helmets too, or are those separate? No, those helmets. You don't get the you don't get the helmets. Let's go up in the truck. And then, and all then the, all the this demon in here. crate gives you this, which uses seatbelt material to put your skinnies, your skinnies with tires on there, uh, and. Um, so you can carry it around. I love the fact you got run flats. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, what do you mean run flats? This? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, an air pump. Yeah, yeah. air pump. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. An yeah. air pump. Yeah. And then you get to keep the crate. Yeah. You turn it into a table. <laughs> and then I was talking to Tim Caniscus and he said if you want all the lining that goes in, that's another buck. Yes. Right, if you yeah, want you all the sound trunk, deadening. Trunk lining. Trunk lining and all the sound deadening. Absolutely. So are you going to get one for yourself? I am. Uh, I'm unfortunately not willing to dedicate what it takes to get one of these. Bob, you're paying. I've got teenagers. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So have you driven it? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, we I, can't, I did the suspension tuning. I know. Since we and can't, the tire tuning. And since we can't drive it, what's it like to launch this? At least not today. Well, tomorrow. Well, it's the fastest car I've ever driven down the quarter mile, of course. Yeah. Right? Because I've never been in anything. It's like one G. One G of. Uh, yeah. What's really amazing is the, the amount of acceleration you get on the trans brake. If you yeah. have someone in the passenger seat, if you have a passenger seat, and they don't have their head against the headrest, it just throws their head back. Uh, guys, I can, I can already see those videos, girls with bikinis. <laughs> <laughs> Woo, I'm in a demon, right? You can see that coming a mile away. <laughs> yep. Yep. Well, thank you very much. You're Appreciate welcome. it. Uh, and hopefully, uh, now that the weather is starting to hopefully break, we'll be uh, driving it tomorrow. So go to tflcar.com and check out uh, you know more videos. We're doing, I did a video with Eric about the wide body, which hopefully we'll edit, and then it will be up on our main channel tomorrow. So thanks for watching. Ian, thank you for supporting this uh, super chat, and see you guys next time. Ciao. Cool. Thanks, Happy Valentine's Day.